copious numbers of projectile points but very few bows and that's what was being used very elegant design very effective and this wood is extremely tough and resilient it makes for a first-rate bow and there is the hunting apparatus of the past very effective that would have been too and to see just how effective I have to let this arrow fly You can see that's quite a devastating injury for a leg of lamb. But if this was live living tissue, it would be even worse. The arrow may well have gone all the way through. And very often animals hit with an arrow are poleaxed, not flat. It's an interesting weapon. And when it arrived in the Mesolithic, just the beginning of the Mesolithic, it gave the hunter the ability to reach out through undergrowth into tight circumstances to bring home the food. And our ancestors' lives depended on it leaving behind evidence of many successful hunts, which Dr Peter Rowley Conway of Durham University has spent a lifetime piecing together. Peter, tell, tell me about the great mystery of the Mesolithic microliths. This is the Mesolithic Swiss Army knife. I think they're part of relatively lightweight hunting equipment for use on a variety of different species. Big ones like aurochs, small ones like roe deer, things in between like red deer and wild boar. And with those, you can't always be sure what kind of animal you're going to encounter next. You want a tool like a microlith, which you can put into a variety of different arrowheads, so you've got the right kind of thing with you. Also, you've got the potential of wounding an animal and following it up. So the result is, you are then tracking an animal and perhaps hunting it on several different occasions, over perhaps as much as a day, a big animal like an aurochs. Aurochs, of course, are the archetypal wild cattle from whom modern domestic cattle are, de are descended, but aurochs are very, very large indeed. This is a shin bone of a modern domestic cow. If I hold up the shin bone of an aurochs alongside it, you'll get what I'm saying, the impression that an aurochs is a very large animal indeed. So if you can imagine a Spanish fighting bull, but about three times the size and probably three times as evil, then you've got a rough idea of what an aurochs is all about. So even with tiny flint weapons, our ancestors could take on mighty aurochs. In one find, an ancient skeleton was pierced with 16 arrowheads. They also had a weapon of a different kind, dogs. As today, these could have been ancient hunting companions to track wounded prey or flush out game. And their reverence for the many different animals they hunted is stunningly revealed in the cave paintings they left behind. It's absolutely incredible. It's not something I'm used to seeing in Britain. The sight of bison browsing. Of course, I've seen these animals in the wild in other parts of Eastern Europe, over in Belarus. And it's an incredible feeling when you're moving through the woods and you come across a herd of these animals. I remember one frosty morning, first sign of them being the mist coming up from their breath. Incredible sight. And think that our ancestors lived alongside these sites. I'm sure to them, this just looked like a meat fest on the hoof. But it wasn't simply about their prey, nor the weapons they had but about how to get close to them, and they could have learned that from another predator they knew. When I travel in the wilderness areas of the Northern Hemisphere, I see wolf tracks on virtually a daily basis but I can count on one hand the times I've actually seen the animals themselves. They're incredibly elusive. So coming to a park like this is fantastic. It gives the most wonderful opportunities to see them up close. 
Throughout the Northern Hemisphere, though, farming communities have traditionally loathed and hated the wolf for their interference with livestock. But what interests me is that hunter-gatherers have a completely different relationship. They revere the animal for its hunting prowess and look to it to teach them how. Wolves are incredibly intelligent creatures. And this was something that wasn't lost on hunter-gatherers. They learned from them. They realised how successful they were as hunters by working together as a pack, as a society. They understood about moving stealthily, being cautious, sniffing the breeze. They became aware of the importance of wind in hunting. Sometimes they even took the wolf's skin and put it on themselves to mimic it, which would enable them to get closer to herds of bison. This is the ancient knowledge I still use when I'm hunting today. Even with a rifle, these are essential skills, and I'm after quarry our ancestors often hunted. Red deer. Fresh tracks. You can see by the blunt tip, these are the tracks of a stag. Tracking is about picking up a trail and being able to follow it. You must also learn to read the landscape through the mind of the deer, taking into account your smell drifting on the wind. Deer have a much more developed sense of smell than we do, and if they sniff you on the breeze, you may not even get to see them. Stalking is about becoming at one with the animal you hunt. You can only do this by respecting that creature. Well, there we are, there's the beast. Beautiful young red deer. Lovely animal. Cleanly killed and uh, incredibly healthy meat. And a moment like this for our ancestors, just as many of the hunter-gatherers I've worked with, is incredibly important. Although you can gather wild plants, it's very difficult to live just on those. Even in the tropical areas, meat plays a very, very important, if not crucial, part of the wild diet. Successfully hunting an animal meant life was secure for a number of days. Very important, it can't be underestimated. It's something that today we take for granted. Meat comes just much too easily. Polythene trays with cling film over the top in the supermarkets. Actually going out and finding your meat for real and then relying on that is a whole different ball game. And it's one in which the hunter and in many ways the male part of life was tremendously important. Gordon, you could give me a hand here. Sure. If you just hold that back a little bit right for ahead. me. That's good. What I'm going to do is I'm going to break a little bit with kind of the traditions of the deer of today uh -huh. and show you what a lot of the hunter-gatherer groups that I've worked with do at moments like this. Hunters, of course, will have expended a lot of energy to catch their food. I very often walk long distances and stalking. And um, so they're pretty famished. They're very hungry normally at this point. And there are two things that are often done. A lot of the cultures in Northern Europe will, when they've got the animal, will bleed it and drink the blood straight away. Uh -huh. And there's carbohydrates of in there. Of course, the blood sugar. So <clears throat> and it gives them the energy. And then the other thing they do is they take the liver and they cook the liver. That's a the, very healthy liver there. It is a very good looking liver as the, as the hunters cut. And of course you inspect a liver to make sure that there are no signs of disease. So what would you look for? Look here? for hardening around the edge, white marks, blemishes, anything that looks out of the ordinary. That looks very healthy, this liver. And the way that's cooked 
is straight on the fire. 